<laughs> I'm Matt Egan, Director of Federal Affairs at Stage Trust, the federal initiative of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Uh, joining us today is Shad White, the State Auditor of Mississippi. Um, Shad White has served as the auditor since 2018, overseeing Mississippi's financial accountability and transparency efforts. He's a natives, native of Sandersville, Mississippi. Yeah, that's correct. All right. Uh, he's graduated the University of Mississippi, where he earned his uh, undergraduate degree in study uh, before going as a Rhodes Scholar, uh, Rhodes Scholar to Oxford University. Um, and then following that, uh, got his law degree from Harvard. Um, so prior to this role, looks um, he was also a criminal defense attorney, and he served as the director of the Mississippi uh, Mississippi Justice Institute. So, uh, Auditor White, we're really glad to have you here today to talk about a really important issue. And yeah, that thanks is, for having me, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, that is this um, excellent report you have written on the the how legal immigration hurts Mississippi. Um, so, just kind of diving right into that, um, what prompted this study? Why do you think it's important that uh, Mississippians understand um, what's going on in their state, um, such an important issue, and how were you able to break this down? Yeah, uh, you know, the the prompt for the study really was, one, us in the auditor's office looking at the headlines and seeing uh, a ton of issues related to our open southern border and, and all of the different ripple effects that happened around the country. And, and, you know, combined with that, we were seeing instances of, of arrests of illegal immigrants here in Mississippi for alleged crimes. And so we started talking about it in the office. And, and when we looked back about 20 years ago, the Mississippi Office of the State Auditor, long before I was state auditor, did a study on the cost of illegal immigration to Mississippi state taxpayers. And so we went back, we looked at their methodology, and we decided it's probably time to update that because a lot of water has gone under the bridge since then. Uh, the, the number of illegal immigrants in the United States has increased dramatically, of course, over the last 20 years. So we dove in and we decided to to redo this report with updated numbers and and we we based a lot of our work on the methodology of that old report but uh, but in order to to recreate the work that had been done we of course had to dive into population studies to estimate the number of illegal immigrants in Mississippi we had to dive into studies on the cost of illegal immigration to our public education system to our health care system to our prison system we had to we had to draw on our background knowledge of of how our own public schools are funded. Every public school in, in the country is funded differently, or at least every state funds them differently. And so we, we draw on our own knowledge of, of extra money that might go to English language learners or, or something like that in order to, to quantify the cost of illegal immigration. And since we put this report out, I think it's been eye-opening for Mississippi taxpayers because it shows folks that basically every state in the country is a border state now. Every state is being touched by illegal immigration. And so we wanted to put some numbers to this problem. We wanted to highlight and quantify what illegal immigration costs your average taxpayer in Mississippi, even if that person doesn't see the effects firsthand every single day. Well, sir, we couldn't agree more. And Americans and uh, people of every state deserve to know what is happening in their state, where their money is going, and what those root causes of those problems are. So um, getting into that, so the report, uh, if I'm reading this correctly, estimates that there are roughly 22,000 illegal immigrants currently in Mississippi. Uh, how did you get to this number? How were you able to do this? We know that finding that uh, finding this n uh, number can be really difficult uh, in my personal experience and stuff. So what was your methodology in get, uh, reaching that number? We first, I would say this: we we relied on population studies, a population study from the University of Mississippi. Uh, but because we know that these are estimates, there's no one out there physically counting each individual illegal immigrant who happens to be in Mississippi. What we decided to do is we decided to use the most conservative possible estimate for the number of illegal immigrants in Mississippi. So 22,000 probably is the lower bound number. The actual number is probably much, much higher than that, especially if you start thinking about the Yale study from a couple of years ago that suggested there were more than 20 million illegal immigrants in Mississippi. Mississippi probably, in the United States, Mississippi should probably have more than 22,000 illegal immigrants if that study is accurate. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to take the the most conservative possible estimate of the number of illegal immigrants so that no liberal journalist would come to me and they would say, you overestimated this and the number's got to be much smaller. No, this is the most conservative possible estimate. And even if you assume that there are only 22,000 illegal immigrants in Mississippi, the cost per year to the state taxpayer is over $100 million a year. So the cost is still astronomical to the state taxpayer, even with that conservative estimate. 
Uh, exactly. You're 100% right. And it is unfortunate that we have to deal with such a slanted media, as we've all seen um, recently, and that we have to be so prepared. But that also means we are on our top game, and that's what you, um, you're showing in this report. So let's dive in. You break this down in some really important areas that are incredibly vital to um, families in the state of Mississippi and across the country. And I think we're going to use that as kind of a venue to show how this can be happening across the board as well. So um, education is a big factor in your and uh, your costs, we know it's a big factor in Texas as well, so um, this is a good reflection. Could you break down t um, to everybody, any, anybody listening and watching this, um, how this impacts education spending, like how you got to this uh, larger number and where those costs are going? Yep, absolutely. So first thing that, that folks need to know is that in the United States, it is uh, illegal under a Supreme Court ruling for a public school in the U.S. to uh, identify or ask the immigration status of a student who's trying to enroll. So, so every state in the country has this problem of, of students who are potentially illegal immigrants enrolling in their public schools. So once you identify or estimate how many students may be illegal immigrants who are enrolling in the public schools, what we wanted to do is dive into our own school funding formula here in Mississippi. And what we can do when we do that is we, we look at how much the state allocates per student and how much that the state then then gives to the school district based on uh, who that student is. So in Mississippi, students are given uh, more money or the district is given more money if the student has certain characteristics. So if they're an English language learner, the, the school district is going to get a little bit more money. Uh, if they're below the poverty rate or at risk, or those are all sorts of things that, that the school uh, that, that may go into the calculation to figure out how much money is going to that school district. So we looked at the formula, we, we identified and estimated the cost per student, we estimated the number of students who are going into the public school system, and that's how we come up with about $25 million per year of state taxpayer dollars. Again, I would accentuate that that's not federal money, that's not, that's not local money, that's state taxpayer dollars going to pay for the cost of illegal immigrants in our public schools. And I'll just say this as a father, too. I have three kids, ages five, three, and one. We just enrolled my child, my oldest child in kindergarten. Uh, I had to fill out a ton of paperwork to get that kid in kindergarten. And I did it personally. Uh, my wife and I were splitting up household duties that day and I did the paperwork to, to enroll our daughter in kindergarten. It was amazing to me what I had to dig up and what I had to disclose in order to get our kid into school. And yet, you know simultaneously that there are folks who are able to walk into the schoolhouse regardless of whether they're an American citizen or not, and they're able to go to public school here. That's unfortunate because it means that we have, we've basically created this magnet here in the United States that's going to draw people here through taxpayer dollars, through, through the money that hardworking Mississippi and American taxpayers are paying into the system. Exactly. And you're... Um... That's so incredibly true, and it seems like that across the board, not just in education. We'll hit those other issues soon, but I want to stay on this. Um, you hit an important point in this education se uh, section where you talk about how this number, um, particularly in education, might be in a low count because of um, the students themselves who are citizens because they, came, they were born here, but their parents came here illegally still. And that's a number that might be nearly impossible to track. That's exactly right. So we, we noted this for both health care and for education. You know, you may have a student who whose parents are illegal immigrants. They come over here. Uh, the child was born here. So technically, by birthright citizenship, they are an American citizen. In Mississippi, that kid is not only eligible to go to public school, but they're also eligible for Medicaid. And so uh, you get this huge cost associated with the children of illegal immigrants who may have been born here. And, and again, right on the money, Matt, I mean, it is very difficult to estimate what the number uh, of kids who are in that situation are, uh, but we know that they cost the Mississippi taxpayers. And so using the most conservative possible estimates, we still find this astronomical cost to taxpayers. 100%. And again, that just goes to continue to show that even this $100 million on Mississippi, that's a, that's a low count. I think it's, um, but that's given the best possible data you have. And again, like you're showing, this is the best case scenario for what the uh, Mississippi, Mississippians are having to pay for um, given the situation that's been created by the Biden-Harris administration going all the way back to the uh, Obama years, um, they've created this world that now uh, American taxpayers, Mississippi taxpayers, Texas taxpayers are having to bear the brunt of. And your report really just kind of lays that out. So um, now let's kind of move more into health care. So um, what are some of the challenges that you had kind of pu pulling these health care numbers? Um, we, in a lot of instances, instance here, um, you're talking about uh, this data is protected by privacy, privacy laws and such. So wh how are you able to determine where that money um, is spent on non-citizens and illegal aliens? 
Yeah, again, we, we had to rely on estimates. And in this case, we were particularly reliant on estimates around how often a family might go to seek emergency room treatment if they didn't have health insurance. So I guess backing up one step in Mississippi, if you're an illegal immigrant, you're not allowed to be on Medicaid. So some states, uh, they provide Medicaid for illegal immigrants. We don't do that here in Mississippi. So we could wipe that cost off the table. Uh, what we then said is, all right, well, how else would an illegal immigrant drive up the cost of health care for taxpayers? Well, one of the ways would be if an illegal immigrant is here and does not have health insurance, they're allowed to go into public hospitals, taxpayer funded hospitals here in the state of Mississippi and get emergency treatment. Everyone is allowed to get emergency treatment regardless of who you may be if you show up to a hospital. So how can we estimate the number of times that a family without insurance might go into a public hospital to get emergency treatment. So based on estimates around that idea, we could then calculate, all right, what's the average cost of that emergency room visit? And now how many illegal immigrants are going to be taking advantage of that system? Okay, now we can start to quantify the overall cost to the Mississippi taxpayer. Layered on top of that, we, we decided, all right, well, let's look and let's say, again, going back to the children who are uh, born here in the United States to illegal immigrants, those children are eligible for Medicaid. And so let's, let's try to estimate the amount of money that would go out the door via Medicaid to care for those children. And that's how you get to the health care number. So that's north of $70 million. That's really the biggest driver of uh, taxpayer cost on illegal immigration. If somebody comes up to me off the street and they say, hey, I, I, I saw that you put out that report. Where's all this money going? What's the biggest cost? The answer in one word or two words is health care for illegal immigrants. Those, those are the that's the basic that's the basic main driver of the cost of taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it before in education. It's also a major pull factor. And why they want to come here is because they know that they're going to have access to healthcare facilities that they may not have in their home countries. And not to mention, they're not going to have to pay that bill. That's right. That's exactly right. I mean, at these at these public hospitals, you're going to provide emergency care. And, and yeah, many, many times uh, the person who ends up coming in for treatment is not going to have to pay anything. And, and so money doesn't fall off of trees. Who has to pay for that? Who's going to pay for the doctor's salaries and the nurse's salaries and the technology? It's going to be the taxpayers. Mm hmm. So um, uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned this in your report. I think it might just be slipping off uh, the top of my head here at the moment. But um, what um, what are hospitals having to eat as well as at these costs? We know that sometimes in Texas and other places as well, these um, hospitals themselves have to eat the cost of uh, illegal aliens when they come into the emergency room. Is that something you were able to calculate at all? We were not able to calculate that piece of it, but you're 100 percent right. And, and one thing that we did not we weren't able to calculate, but we should bear in mind, of course, is, you know, if, if an illegal immigrant needs to seek emergency room treatment at a non-public hospital, at a private hospital, well, they're going to be able to walk in the door and they're going to be able to get treatment at that private hospital. And, and then the private hospital is going to bear the cost of that. Taxpayers won't necessarily bear the cost of that. But what happens to the state as a whole? Well, when you have somebody who comes in and they get uncompensated care, that's going to drive up private insurance costs for everybody else. So for anybody out there who's paying for their own private insurance, you're going to pay for it one way or the other, whether you're paying for it via your tax dollars or you're paying for it when you pay that insurance premium every month. Well, and um, as we've seen, I think everybody has seen those uh, premiums go up over the last couple of years as well. And there's so many different reasons ranging from the, the terrible economy built by the Biden-Harris administration to the border crisis. It affects every part of your life. And I, again, that's what I really want to stress about this report is that's what you've shown here is that everything, it, it just ripple effects all the way back down. It's not just um, at the border. It is everywhere. And it, you see it in, gosh, unfortunately, all aspects of your life. Um, and when we talk about these hospital care and we talk about schools, um, it's more than just those uh, financial costs as well. When you when you have to take somebody to the emergency room and you and you're, there's a, now a line because there's a, a, we see this across the country, not just in border states, because illegal immigrants have filled up the emergency room for sometimes even just basic primary care items. Um, now you are stuck dealing with maybe a kid with a broken arm or something at, at a late hour and you can't get in. This is a problem we're seeing across the country. I'm sure it's something people in Mississippi see as well, um, and that's 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 where um, the, that's what that seventy million dollars represents to me when I think about it. Um, it's um, the societal impacts as well as the health care um, capabilities of the state get stretched. Um, the, each um, each doctor can only do so many things, 
and now they may not be able to see um, some of those Mississippians that they used to and such. Um, we see in border communities a lot, emergency services get stretched really thin um, in these small counties because they just simply don't have enough to go around because of the influx of illegal aliens. So when I see the, that $70 million number or relating back over to education, um, when we start bringing in students who aren't up to standards in reading or um, just basic English, the rest of the students as well suffer. Um, that money gets shifted away from uh, the citizens to the, now the illegal aliens and standards start to fall. And we don't, talk, we don't get to talk about what some of these um, driving factors are. And again, that we talk about the, that really that's the primary impact uh, um, on the people of Mississippi and across the country that you're laying out here that I think people can see once they read this report, all that money is being spent, all those dollars, that's shifted away from Mississippi taxpayers' children and their health care needs. That's 100 percent right. You know, I, I tend to I tend to talk a lot about the dollar figure. Right. And you're making a very important separate point. You know, when we say, oh, well, Mississippi taxpayers spend about 100 million dollars per year on services for illegal immigrants. A lot of times what my brain runs to is, well, how else could we be using that one hundred million dollars? You know, that that would be one of the largest teacher pay increases in the history of the state. It would wipe out probably somewhere between a third and a quarter of our entire grocery tax. So I always, I always point that out because working families are going to the grocery store and we, we load up my minivan and take my three kids there. And I'm, I'm always shocked at how little you can buy these days with $350 at the grocery store. Uh, we're taxed on that. And so I always think about what we could be doing with that money. Uh, instead of instead of spending it on services for illegal immigrants. But but your separate but very important point is that regardless of the dollar amount, the overcrowding of hospitals, the overcrowding of schools, and frankly, the the excess burden on our law enforcement, those are real considerations that we have to take into account. So you made the case great on health care and public education, but let me add law enforcement to that as well. We can quantify how many illegal immigrants are in the prison system, right? That's that's relatively easy to add up compared to some of these other calculations that we're doing. But what's very difficult to quantify is when there is crime caused by illegal immigrants, what extra burden does that place on that local law enforcement officer? Does that extra burden also include uh, training on immigration status and working with ICE for that local law enforcement officer? Is it going to require more police officers on the street? And, and how many more police officers, how many more cruisers, how much more equipment are, 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 going to, are going to have to be expended in order to make our streets safe? And not only that, but you've got to have, you've got to have law enforcement officers who are trained on immigration law now uh, beyond just the normal burglaries and murders and all that kind of stuff. So these are the considerations that really cannot be captured in a dollar figure. And that's what we have to bear in mind, too, when we're having these conversations. No, I think that's exactly right. I, when it comes to community safety, which I'm glad that's the issue um, you brought up, um, I think that's where it's stressed the hardest many times because that's what families, I think, think of first, right? When they're, when they're looking to live somewhere, is this a safe place to live? But sometimes when those things are brought forced onto you and now all of a sudden your community isn't as safe as it used to be, and now instead of patrolling the streets, this, these officers are either having to be retrained in uh, new programs or maybe having to deal with tr crime in the community that wasn't there before, so now they can't be um, as, w as wide as they used to be, uh, those secondary effects, again, are just astronomical and put a heavy, heavy burden um, on not just the state but the localities as well, um, particularly when it comes to law enforcement. I think that's 100 percent right. And I had a friend of mine who, who pointed out the other day, he said, well, you know, if you look at some of the data, illegal immigrants per illegal immigrant commit less crime than U.S. citizens. And the point that I made back to him is even if that is true, what you've got to bear in mind is that even in Mississippi, we still have sanctuary cities. So when the Trump administration was in office, they identified Jackson, Mississippi as a city with sanctuary city policies. They even threatened to cut off a DOJ grant because of those policies. Now, that means that arresting an illegal immigrant is going to be costlier to uh, to the to the law enforcement entity than arresting an American citizen. Why? Because you might arrest that illegal immigrant and maybe ICE sends you a detainer. And if you're in a sanctuary city, your city is going to have a policy that says, hey, throw that detainer out. Just throw that sheet of paper away. Don't worry about it. So now what have we got? We've, we're going to have to release this person or, or process this person through our judicial system instead of going through uh, what should happen, which is going through ICE and deporting that person, I would hope. So those are the things that I see 
even in a state like Mississippi, even in a red state. I think a lot of times Mississippians and probably Texans too, they think, well, you know, our state is a red state and we, we surely don't have some of these policies in place and these crazy things that you see happening in Colorado or Pennsylvania or even Ohio. But, but the truth is that, yes, this stuff is happening here and we've got blue cities in Mississippi just, just like they have blue cities everywhere else. And those cities often do not cooperate with immigration officials. Oh, that's something we truly understand in Texas as well. We have the People's Republic of Austin, which just happens to be our capital, which is about as far left as you can get. So, um, yeah, we completely understand that problem. Um, said you took the words right out of my mouth there. Um, and I think the other important fact uh, thing when it comes to illegal alien crime is every single one of them is preventable if we just prevent them from entering the country. Yep. So I've um, had tons of folks ask me after the report, well, what can we do? What are we supposed to do with this information? And and there are states that are doing good things at the state level to combat illegal immigration. So I, I know some states have sent over National Guard to the border. That's great. Some states have identified illegal immigrants and bust them to Martha's Vineyard and other places. That's great. All for that. I noticed that some states, Texas is one of them, Florida, I believe, is one of them, ask for immigration status when someone goes to the hospital. And so that's deterred some uh, expenditures of public funds on health care for illegal immigrants. That's good stuff. But the truth of the matter is, those are small fixes relative to the real fix, and the real fix is securing our southern border. I mean, that's only going to happen if you if you elect a president and put into place a presidential administration that is serious about the border. That's the real answer. It is, and um, until we have a White House that's willing to take that issue seriously and not hide from it or openly lie about it, Americans, unfortunately, are going to continue to die, and the taxpayers are going to bear that price as well. That's the really sad thing is, is we've been talking a lot about numbers and data and big picture effects of illegal immigration so far, Matt. But I mean, I, I can't I can't help but think about two instances in the last month that involved the arrest of uh, an alleged illegal, illegal immigrant here in two different places in Mississippi, one in North Mississippi, one in Philadelphia, Mississippi. In the case of the one in North Mississippi, that person is accused of raping a 10 year old child twice. Allegedly, they were deported many years ago and came back into the United States again, came back to North Mississippi, and now that family and that victim have suffered. And then in Philadelphia, Mississippi, just a few weeks ago, again, an illegal immigrant, allegedly, according to the local law enforcement entities, shot up about 15 cars, three people injured, and now that person's under arrest here. So, yeah, you know what? The, the data are compelling. The cost here we have to pay attention to, but there are individual human stories of people being hurt by illegal immigrants here in the United States, specifically in Mississippi, and that's not going to stop until we get real about securing our border, period. 100% correct. And again, the truly heartbreaking thing is every single one of those tragedies is preventable. And yes. that's what really should make every American's blood boil, is we chose to let those things happen by continuing to have an open border. That's right especially in that first instance that I mentioned, and the guy is deported and then is able to come back, is able to come back in the country and just make his way right back to North Mississippi where he can continue causing problems. He had allegedly, again, been arrested multiple times by local, local law enforcement before he was deported the last time and comes right back. And so when you hear people say, oh, you know, we've got folks over here who are causing problems and, and you know, and then the rebuttal from the left is, well, you can't say that. And that's very racist to say, like, you have to open up the newspaper and read about what is going on in these communities. And it's not just on the border. It's around the country. It's everywhere. Every state is a border state now. Yeah. And I think the American people are done with this. They're done with hearing these polite words on the news media about things that are absolute tragedies. I mean, we have... Um, yeah, the people of Washington are sitting here at cocktail parties while the rest of the country is burning, and they've, they're the ones who lit the, lit the match, and they don't really seem to care. And if the American people feel that way, I think it's because it's true for the vast majority of them. You know, I, I went to law school on the East Coast, and um, I always knew that I wanted to come back to Mississippi. And, and part of the reason is I wanted to be back here because I wanted to raise my family here. I wanted to be near my family Part of the reason was that I wanted to serve my state and help my state achieve its potential. And I didn't know how I would do that. I thought maybe I would do that as a prosecutor at first. And then I, I practiced law in the private sector. And I thought, well, maybe it'll be, you know, doing this and, and working in the private sector. And, and then I got appointed state auditor uh, at 32. And, and 
that was that was an interesting moment because I thought, you know, this this might not have been what I would have imagined I would do, but here I am in this role where I can make a difference for Mississippians, and and I really understand what Mississippians are going through because I was born here, I was raised here, I got an education somewhere else, and then I came back, and so now I get to deploy that against these problems. Again, I never would have guessed that illegal immigration would be this big of a problem here in Mississippi back in high school or college when I was at Ole Miss. But but now that we're here and now that it is such an acute problem, we have got to focus on these issues because especially for those of us who live in these communities and live in these states, because a lot of times folks on the coast, they're just not going to get it and they're not going to pay attention to it because they don't have to live with the consequences of the issue. They don't have to live with it. But for those of us who are here, who are on the ground, who have been put into a position to make a difference, we have to keep telling the world what's going on. Yeah, you're right. I mean, these are folks who live in gated communities and tell you a wall is racist. That's exactly right. That's so exactly that, right. And and they I, need to, those kinds of folks need to come down to the middle of the country where we deal with these kinds of issues, the effects on our economy, the effects on our safety, the effects on our public institutions, the cost to us as taxpayers, and they need to see it firsthand because otherwise they're not ever going to fully understand uh, what people in the middle of the country are feeling. And, and everyone wakes up and they're shocked when President Donald Trump gets elected. Well, those of us who are in the middle of the country are not shocked at all because we know that we know that we want somebody who's going to stand up and take the border seriously, take a, a, a bunch of other issues seriously that we care about. But the border is top of mind. Absolutely. We couldn't agree more from Texas for obvious reasons as well. Um, so um, earlier I mentioned um, the uh, localities in Texas facing these problems and just really not being able to bear the financial brunt of this along with the human costs and the human costs it's having on their communities. Um, I spoke with um, a gentleman from a border county in Texas who, know, who people in their county have died because they, EMS couldn't get there in time because they were having to serve illegal aliens, things of that nature. I'd be curious as to what you're hearing from a non-border state in Mississippi from uh, local community leaders from uh, the towns and counties there in Mississippi. People are concerned, and, and I talked a, a bit about the two arrests that just happened in the last couple of months here that made national news. On Fox News, I turned on Jesse Waters a few nights ago, and there was the mugshot of the guy that had been arrested in Philadelphia, Mississippi. So people down here are concerned, and obviously we hear about it first before, before it makes national news. But look, th this is not the only kind of story like this that pops up. There was a story a couple of months ago that popped up about uh, illegal immigrants who were maybe moving into a large vacant hotel in North Mississippi. And so people then are all of a sudden concerned about the effects on the community and what that's going to mean, uh, what sorts of federal grants are being drawn down to push those those folks into that hotel. Uh, another story about a nonprofit in North Mississippi that, uh, that again, is allegedly going to uh, try to get documents for the children of illegal immigrants. Those kinds of things. Things bubble up around here all the time. And, and, you know, I think one of the reasons that these stories are coming up at the local level all the time is not just that people are turning on the news and they're, they're seeing this, this stuff happen on national news in Texas or somewhere else, but because they see real evidence of this kind of thing with their own eyes. When they, when they go to church on Sunday and they see the police chief for their town tell them about arresting an illegal immigrant for allegedly raping a 10 year old twice and he can pull out the mugshot and show it to him on his cell phone it gets real it gets real that's not happening in some far off world that's happening here so that's what i hear from people here in mississippi and and frankly they're they're just as tired of their state leaders who don't stand up and talk about this as they are their national leaders who don't stand up and talk about this and and i have to remind folks that uh, i don't even like that word leader i think the word ought to be public servant because those folks are there to serve you so you need to demand that your public servants who work for you not just in washington dc but in jackson mississippi that they stand up and talk about this issue and do something to combat it as state auditor my main role is to dig up facts on how how we spend public money and shine a light on it. You don't really get to change anything as, a, as an auditor. That's kind of the definition of an audit as you're looking at what an entity is doing. But I think as long as my team and I continue to shine a light on these big issues, it makes it more likely that policymakers will ultimately respond. Well, man, I couldn't say, I couldn't say anything else to really add. I agree with everything you just said. Um, yeah. Everybody needs to stand up now. Um, it's it's going to take United Front to really make this turn around because it's going to take a massive effort to turn this issue around in particular. So uh, kind of looking at that, um, we're 
Texas has obviously done studies like this looking at the impacts of illegal immigration. Many states have not. Um, what would you say to state auditors out there who haven't undertaken this task that you'd like to see them do it? Um, you've done a great job here. Um, I think there's there obviously I saw some other questions after this one that I want to get into. But what would you say to them to encourage them to get, to get this done, to show their uh, the people of their states and the rest of the country what is happening, not just with their tax dollars, and, but with the people in their community? What I would say is they need to do it. They need to do this study because everyone needs to understand the cost of illegal immigration. And, and look, this is a really important point. Um, we don't we don't come up with these ideas on our own in the state auditor's office. We often look to other auditor's offices or previous auditors to get ideas, and we often copy their methodology if it's been proven accurate. And so that's what we did here with this illegal immigration study. We looked back and we saw, okay, 20 years ago we did this study. We need to redo this study to update the numbers. There have been many other instances where I look at what Texas is doing or I look at what Florida is doing or other states, and, and we'll just call that government office and say, hey, we want to repeat your methodology here in Mississippi. We did that with DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion spending. We called Governor DeSantis's office in Florida because they had their policy shop had done a calculation of how much taxpayer money was going to DEI in public universities in Florida. We got their methodology. We used it here and we produced the same report for Mississippi. So what I would say out there is if you're in a governor's office or you're in an auditor's office anywhere in the country, you should be doing work on this kind of an issue. And if you want to borrow our methodology, give my office a call and we're happy to share with you how we looked at this issue, what data points we pulled, what sources we used, all of that kind of stuff. There's really no excuse. Everybody ought to be looking at this issue because it affects your voters, your citizens. Well, there it is. There's the open invitation to all the other states to give you a call so you can help them get this done so there's no reason they can't get it done. That's right. So, so um, along those lines, when you talk about methodology, there's one more thing I wanted to bring up. Um, you talked about, uh, well, two things, two questions there. Um, were there any particular areas where you felt like the federal government or any agencies were getting in your way of, getting, of uh, data you should have access to that you didn't get access to? And then um, I'd like to ask, after that, I'd like to ask about kind of comparing from the, I think it was what, a 2006 study was the previous one done in, in the state of Mississippi, yep. um, what the major differences are between your study and that one. But Yeah, we really didn't have a ton of difficulty getting documents. And, and the main reason is that we didn't have to go to the federal government to get any information. So we, we pulled publicly available information. We used we used studies uh, from our universities here in Mississippi. And, and then we, pull, we pulled data from the state agencies here in Mississippi. And and just speaking bluntly, I mean, the state agencies here in Mississippi, uh, they're used to the auditor's office calling saying, hey, I need these 10 kinds of documents here in the next two weeks because we audit them all the time. And so we, we really didn't have a ton of difficulty getting documents that would have been different if we'd had to go to the federal government to get a bunch of information. But we we thankfully did not. You asked about some of the differences between our study and the study uh, a couple of decades ago. We, we wanted to look at the same kinds of spending, so healthcare, education, prison costs. And then we, we wanted to make sure that we were using uh, the same sorts of intuitions that they used back then. So, you know, you, you want to think, all right, well, we, we can calculate prison costs, but they point out in the study, you know, 20 years ago, that doesn't capture the cost of extra policing of a neighborhood. So we need to point that out. So those are the kinds of things that we drew on from the previous report. Uh, of course, the biggest difference is the numbers. You know, the biggest difference is we dive in and, and we can see slightly different costs or, or dramatically different costs. So back then, you know, the, the number was closer to $20, 25000000 million of taxpayer money going to pay for illegal immigrants or services for illegal immigrants. Today, it's north of $100 million based on, based on our calculations. So, uh, again, I think both studies probably used very conservative estimates. So that's sort of the lower bound number. The one hundred million dollars is the lower bound number. Uh, that's that's why we that's why we wanted to rely on that old study, because it had been around a long time. It held up and uh, and, and we could go back to it and point it to its methodology because it had been proven previously. No, that makes all the sense in the world, and it also gives you that comp that comparison uh, to make possible what has changed over the last 20 years. So that makes a whole lot of sense to me. Um, so I guess now that you've done this study, so what are some policy changes that you would recommend then to the state of Mississippi? Um, we talked a little bit about, it, about some of the things that need to happen in the federal, uh, federal government, starting with obviously just shutting down the border. But what would you recommend to the state and to any other states that are facing these same problems? 
Well, first, I'd start at the local level and say to any sanctuary city, including the city of Jackson, which, as far as I know, still has sanctuary city policies on the books, get those policies off your books. Do not be a sanctuary city. That, that's thing number one that I would point out. Let's start at the most basic local level. Uh, moving up the chain, you know, going to state government. Again, if your state, Mississippi does not do this, but if your state provides Medicaid for illegal immigrants, stop that. Pass a statute that bans that. Um, other states have gone another step, which I think is great, which is asking for the immigration status of a person coming to get treatment at a hospital. I would add that into your policy suite of things that you're doing. And then again, you know, other states like Florida have done a great job of identifying illegal immigrants and busing them to the communities uh, of, of folks who, you know, vote Democrat and they uh, they don't see the actual consequences of an open border. So uh, again, if you're a governor out there, that ought to be something you should consider too, absolutely, if you're able to identify illegal immigrants. Um, and then just support your local law enforcement. So uh, the bottom line is that until we get control of our southern border, no matter what we do, you are going to have illegal immigrants that, that spread across the country. So you've got to give your local law enforcement the resources to keep its people safe, to keep their people safe. Couldn't agree more with all of that. Um, that in the end, that's the basic role of government is to keep the, be, to keep the people safe. So if we can't do that, then we are in a real bad place um, as far as looking forward. Uh, so that's always my favorite question when you go speak to a middle school or high school group is, is some kid always stands up and they ask the most important question, which is what is the purpose of government? And, and my answer is always it's to keep us safe. The most important function of government is to keep us safe. And we do that through a military when we're dealing with international enemies. And we do that through a police force locally when we're dealing with crime here. But that's the most important function of government. Well, uh, yeah, and um, I think something that really needs to be pointed out, too, is the important role of shining a light on government and making sure things are being done correctly. And that really is one of the biggest roles of a state auditor. And um, doing this particular report wasn't easy. It was a heavy burden to uh, pick up. And you know you were going to be under the gun from people on the left, probably all the way up to the White House, um, trying to find and poke holes in this. But in the end, you did the right thing. You represented the people, finding out where their things were going, why these problems were occurring in the community, and why some of these standards, I'm sure, have slipped, um, despite the fact, um, without really it being at all, the I guess, the community's fault. Um, this is a problem that was created in Washington and been forced upon the people of Mississippi, Texas, and the rest of the country. And you've sh shown them this is directly where it's hurting your bottom line, as well as where it's just directly hurting your community. So I really hope the people there can appreciate that. Um, and with that, um, I guess I would appreciate any uh, kind of closing comments you might have, anything you would like, to, uh, any points you would like to make that I might have missed. Final point, and this relates to what you just said, Matt, is that the credit for doing a report like this really, it does not go to me. It goes to the analysts in the state auditor's office. So I said the same exact thing that you said to me to them when we started this analysis, I said this is going to be controversial and folks are going to try to poke holes in this any way they possibly can. So we have to be perfect. We have to be perfect. And, and I put that onus on that team. That team is led by a Mississippi State engineer who's got his master's in public administration and a great group of analysts that we built around him. And he delivered. I mean, he delivered a great, clear report. And folks that have tried to poke a hole in it across the national media spectrum have been unable to because they know this is a real problem and because of the quality of the work that those men and women did in that office. And the other final point that I would make is simply this. Whether you're talking about illegal immigration or any other form of waste in government, our country is waking up. And we are starting to take this seriously as voters. You can see it. J.D. Vance just did an interview here in the last 48 hours where he talked about all the brokenness and waste in the federal government. Of course, Donald Trump, President Trump, has announced that uh, he'd like to start a government efficiency committee run by Elon Musk to come in and look at all those issues and identify them. That shows you that normal Americans are sick and tired of all of the waste in government. Now, as state auditor, it's not my job to look at the federal government, but it is my job to look at state government. And down here, we've identified millions of dollars going to illegal immigrants, millions of dollars going to DEI programs or our universities, hundreds of thousands of dollars every year going to pay for cell phones for state employees that aren't ever even turned on. 
millions of dollars going to people who are not eligible for entitlement programs, IT contracts that are incredibly wasteful, even compared to our sister states around us. Texas does a much better job on IT procurement than we do. So those are the things that we're identifying here in Mississippi, and it's because taxpayers in Mississippi and around the country are ready for somebody to take a chainsaw to all the fat so that they can actually see some benefits from all these taxes that they're paying. 100%. And sometimes accidents are made. We are humans. After all, we're going to make mistakes. Sometimes it simply is malfeasance and people trying to get away with things that they shouldn't be doing. And that's why um, <laughs> auditing and like we said, shining light is so important. And that's an incredible, uh, incredible job you've done with this report. And uh, <laughs> be curious to hear what, what other projects you have, you guys have coming down the pike to make sure uh, Mississippians are um, getting the most out of their tax dollars. We'll keep you posted, brother. No doubt. All right. Well, thank you very much, um, especially for joining us while you're under a hurricane there in Mississippi. We hope you and your family stay safe as well as everybody there. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. All right, have a good rest of your day, Auditor. Thank you. Thanks, man.